Supreme Court was set up to have nine justices. And when there is an even number of justices and the court can split four to four, which given the personnel who remain on the court is a likely result in many important cases, what happens is that the lower court decision is affirmed, but it doesn't become a precedent for the whole country. It will not bring the Supreme Court to a complete halt, but it certainly will create serious complications. It, it among the cases now being scrutinized following the death of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, many are pointing to Friedrichs versus the California Teachers Association, the case that produced plenty of contentious oral arguments and will now likely mean this union and others can impose their will and their financial muscle over those who don't wish to be held accountable to a union they aren't even a member of. As to what this could mean for public sector unions across America, let us dive in. Welcome back to The Hardline, senior reporter for The 74, covering education issues in America, Carolyn Fennessy, joined by professor at George Mason University School of Law and author of Lawless, the Obama administration's unprecedented assault on the Constitution and the rule of law, David Bernstein. I want to thank you both for joining us. Carolyn, you were there for those oral arguments. Give us a sense of how heated it got. Sure. So the uh, the parties on both sides were kind of looking to Justice Scalia as the one they thought could swing sort of either way um, and come down either with the unions or with the teachers who opposed them. But during oral arguments, Justice Scalia seemed to come down pretty firmly with the teachers who opposed being forced to be in these unions, um, kind of buying their argument that uh, even seemingly non-controversial issues like uh, collective bargaining, contract negotiation are inherently political when you're in a public sector union. And so forcing people to support that with their dues violates their First Amendment. Did you get a sense that Judge Scalia was leaning the other way and perhaps there was a part of the argument that actually got to him and, and persuaded him at, at that moment? He seemed pretty much from the get go to be on board with uh, with the teachers who did not want to be on part uh, part of the unions. David, give us an idea of what this means then, not just to the teachers' union in California, but what it may mean. We just heard coming in that this really may not have a lot of impact across the country. I get the sense otherwise. Well, the public sector unions are really the only unions that still have substantial membership. Uh, I think half of all Americans who belong to unions belong to public sector unions, and, they will, and the reason they're able to keep their membership up so much is that if you work for the government in many places, uh, you're required to either be a member of the union or at least pay the dues. So they have an automatic source of funding. So uh, if this case had come out uh, that the unions can't require the cl collection of dues uh, with the rationale, well, we're representing you even if you don't want us to, uh, then the union sector would probably lose a lot of its members. That's already happened in Wisconsin, for example, where uh, the governor got legislation through that reduced the power of public sector unions and made it more or less voluntary to join them. It would have happened nationwide. and would really be a, a, a harsh blow to the public sector unions. Now, when you talk about that source of funding, I want to get there because this case focused on Rebecca Friedrichs. She and others opted not to join the teachers union, but they had to pay the union dues because the union said, hey, we went out and did the contract, so you've got to give us some money regardless. It doesn't make a difference whether or not you want to be here. David, in your opinion then, if indeed this gets back in front of a Supreme Court, a full Supreme Court, and if indeed the unions lose, how much power and how much money are they at risk of losing here? Oh, I think it's a tremendous amount of money and power. Uh, the unions rely really on this fact that people have to have to pay the dues to have their job, and the dues are often substantial in the high hundreds of dollars. Uh, often, and it's, you know, there are a lot of teachers other police officers, other public employees. And the fact is that a lot of these folks would say, well, I don't feel I'm getting my money's worth out of the union, or I don't believe in the union, I don't believe in what they're doing. For example, I'm sure there are some teachers who feel like, I'm a great teacher, I do really well, why should I get paid exactly the same in step with all the other teachers of my, uh, who started the same year. We're talking about power here, aren't we, David? In, in many instances here, we're talking about union power here in order, and, and I, I've said this a million times before, it's to protect those who don't necessarily deserve to get the protection. It's not just teachers, it's all across America where people are protected by unions and they don't deserve to be. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong inherently with a voluntary labor union. The problem is that the way the unions 
operate now, they devote a tremendous amount of, especially the public sector unions, they vote, devote a tremendous amount of their resources not to just bargaining, trying to represent workers, preventing, say, a teacher from being unfairly fired by a principal, but they're engaging in political lobbying. They're the biggest donors to the Democratic Party. So if you're being forced to uh, belong to a union, you're being forced to give money uh, not just to the party, because in theory that could be a separate First Amendment issue, but also uh, the unions are trying to preserve the public school monopoly and the, and the lockstep pay for teachers. And a lot of teachers don't agree with that. A lot of teachers would be happier with at least public school choice, with merit pay, and their voices don't there get you heard. Go. Yep. The, the merit pay is a big part of it. You're exactly right. i got about a minute left here, Carolyn. Without Scalia, it's now likely a 4-4 split. Do you get a sense of, of any wiggle room here whatsoever? I mean, everybody now is talking about, well, maybe somebody will jump ship. I, I don't get that sense here. It looks like it's pretty solid. Yeah, I don't either. I think the four justices who are uh, in the liberal block are pretty firmly on that side, and they've um, already decided a kind of similar case a few years ago about uh, home health aides in the Illinois Medicaid program um, that they pretty firmly then said they still um, were in favor of this precedent from the 1970s that sort of creates this delineation between full members and supporting just the collective bargaining versus the political activities, and I don't really see any change there. And obviously, if you look at it from one perspective at least, there's got to be a lot of people in the unions, quite frankly, just wiping their brow and going, Phew. I mean, it's not as if that they're thankful that anybody passed, God forbid, but to be able to at least hold their power base for the moment is what a lot of them were at least hoping to do. It's a fascinating subject. We're going to have to address this again because this one's going to come around again. Carol and Fennessy, David Bernstein, I want to thank you both for joining us, giving us your expertise. Now, the elephant in the Texas room over a death and how it was pronounced. That's coming up next when we continue and we go around the dial right here on the hard line.